Okay, I hope that works better now. Check it out. Thank you, Kasia, for your very friendly and terribly exaggerated <laughs> introduction. Because I normally don't get no, no, don't get nervous for talks, but now I am nervous. <laughs> um, not only because of that, also because um, of the nature of the combination of the topic I'm talking about and the nature of the audience. Because um, I uh, was asked to talk about um, the role neuroscience. You're gonna play. lose it again there. <laughs> <laughs> because of the nature of the work neuroscientists can help us in, with, in SLA and in particular in the study of uh, aptitude uh, and I'm not a neuroscientist at all I'm of course uh, an SLA person uh, but I have followed the neuroscience literature from a distance for longer than I care to admit since I was an undergraduate really uh, so I have some idea of what is being done um, not that I know a lot about it, but I have an impression of what could or could not be improved from the point of view of SLA. That does not mean neuroscientists have to agree with it. So what I'm going to talk about here um, today is first some terminology to make sure we know that we are on the same page. Then where we are coming from in the study of aptitude, very, very briefly, uh, where we are and maybe should be going in aptitude research. And I will structure that as follows, independent variable, dependent variable, design studying the two, the need for a longitudinal perspective, the need for more theoretical inter integration, practical applications, I, I, I will do that very, very quickly because there's not enough time, uh, possible contributions from the neurosciences, uh, some principal stuff, some issues, and also an example or proposal for maybe what people could be working on. Okay, we'll see. All right, so why study aptitude, first of all? Some people study aptitude as a form of basic research. They like to describe what aptitude is like, uh, um, what components it has. That goes back all the way to the early 1900s, research by, Gil by Guilford on the structure of intelligence and that sort of a thing. Um, it really does not seem to be my day for technology here. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why Macs are so much better, you know, I wouldn't have all these problems with it. That's right, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, basic descriptive research, um, but also um, applied research in various ways. Predictive applied research for selection, who are we going to admit to this course, only the ones that are likely to benefit from it. But also, maybe more interestingly, adaptation of the way of teaching, uh, adaptation of the kind of training maybe in order to prepare people better for learning and ideally matching of individual aptitudes with teaching. And then finally, uh, aptitude research can also play an explanatory role, which I'll, I'll insist a bit on today, namely the role of aptitude in interaction with treatment reveals, reveals really the process of learning that is going on. If an aptitude and the treatment are a good match for each other, that means the aptitude facilitates the kind of learning required by the treatment. So it's one way of getting around the black box idea of I teach in a certain way, something comes out, why? Okay. All right, so very, very brief history of aptitude research. The golden age for aptitude research is always when there's a war. <laughs> First World War, research and aptitude in the sense of intelligence. Um, that was in cooperation at the beginning between uh, Terman at Stanford and Binet in Paris at the time. Terman went by boat all the way from San Francisco to, to Paris to meet with uh, Binet and put the first intelligence tests together. Mm -hmm. World War II, that's when research on foreign language learning really took off because hundreds of thousands of people were sent all over the globe and had to be able to communicate in minimal ways with the natives. And that was in minimal ways. The first line in the textbook for Dutch that was developed at the time was, where are the landmines? <laughs> <laughs> you can see where they were coming from. <laughs> and then some people these days talk about the war on terrorism. I won't call it World War III, even though some people seem to look at it that way. Um, and of course, what we need now, or what the government needs, 
is research on aptitude for high-level language learning. We're no longer interested in whether 100,000 soldiers can communicate about the landmines with the locals, but about whether we have enough spies who can listen in on conversations between terrorists in order to know what they are saying exactly. So, in between these various stages I've mentioned, from 1980 to 2000 more or less, we had a couple of decades of neglect uh, because of several reasons. One, the belief that aptitude is only relevant in the context of outdated teaching methodologies, which has since been proven to be wrong. The belief in immutability of aptitude, seeing it as only a predictor and, and therefore less important than, say, motivation, which is, of course, more malleable. Um, and if seen as a basis for possible adaptation of teaching through aptitude human interaction, then, of course, we have the logistic difficulties of implementing API and the fear of introducing a form of apartheid. This is a very big issue in the US, very egalitarian philosophy. You have to teach everybody in the same way. Okay? I, mm -hmm. I disagree with that. I, have to, I think you have to teach everybody so that they can perform to the best of their abilities. Um, but anyway, uh, go to the point that aptitude testing was even legally forbidden in a number of American states in the early 80s, for instance, when I took the GRE test. Uh, I remember that it said, if you're in the state of New York, you cannot take this test because it's not allowed. Anyway, uh, I don't want to insist on all these things. Um, aptitude research is blossoming now again. We have more theoretical motivation for the aptitude tests that are being developed. We have many more specific tests for pronunciation, for instance, or uh, for declarative versus procedural learning. Um, because usually we talk about declarative procedural in this context, but there's also the aptitude that some people are called declarative memory versus declarative versus procedural memory. Um, and we make more specific predictions also about what domain of language, what stage of learning, what kinds of tasks these aptitudes are good for. And that's very important because I think the biggest mistake throughout the history of SLA research is overgeneralization, doing uh, research with 20 people on how they learn two types of consonants and then say, this is how second language acquisition works. I'm only exaggerating a little bit. Okay? We have seen way too much of that. So aptitude treatment interaction research is another part of what I think makes contemporary research more interesting. Um, and of course, we have better, more reliable, more valid, more varied outcome tests than before, even though a lot remains to be done in that area also. So in the various uh, areas, what should be done? Independent variables, what is the situation? We have gone from talking about aptitude to aptitudes, because we have come to realize that there is no one aptitude, that there is a number of specialized aptitudes, and maybe you can design a test that combines many of them, but certainly it's not like it is one thing. We have gone from tests like the MLAT or the PLAB or, or the LAMA to test batteries, including a whole bunch of different tests, sometimes taken from elsewhere, sometimes developed especially for the high lab. So I will say a few more things about the high lab, in part because it is a very interesting test, in part also because it was conducted at the University of Maryland, where I, work. I was a consultant in the early stages of this. So the motivation for the high lab project, the project was to um, be able to predict at higher levels of learning and for more difficult languages also. In other words, Chinese, Korean, Arabic, rather than Spanish or French or, or Dutch. Um, so you could, of course, make the test harder to achieve that, but you could also think a bit more thoroughly and say, well, maybe different abilities are at stake uh, or uh, play a role in these various kinds of learning, especially the more advanced ones. So the stages in that project for developing this battery were, first of all, developing, of course, a rationale for what tests to use. I did it again, I think. Um, and then, um, <coughs> six. Sorry. That's all my fault, okay? <laughs> <laughs> So, first of all, the, the rationale for what that we use based on the SLA literature, but that couldn't help us all that much because there is very little research on advanced learners. So much SLA research is based on you know, classroom learners in the first couple of years for obvious reasons. 
reliability and constructability of the tests were then a very important, very long stage. Okay? You cannot have a good test battery if your individual tests don't have good reliability and validity. And then the last stage was the predictive validity. To what extent does this whole new battery of tests do better than other tests? So this battery of tests consists of 14 different parts. Uh, given the time limitations, I'm not going to go into any of this. This is just a list of them. And uh, this uh, table here drawn from Dowdy 2018 shows that some of these components, like fast brain, good ear, to, to make it simple, are represented in either the MLIT or the high lab or both. So what is in red is present in the MLIT. What is in black is present in high lab. So you can see high lab is broader than MLIT, but there is some overlap. So how well do the two tests, when I say the two, I mean high lab compared to MLAT, which has always been the most widely used one until recently, how well do they do? Um, we see um, MLAT here. Let's see, does that work? No. Okay, no pointer, okay. No, 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 no. Um, so if you look at the uh, categories there, the columns, I mean MLAT, and then high lab, you have one, three, four, one, three, four. These are different levels of difficulty of languages. One being the easiest, four the most difficult. So one would be for an English speaker Spanish, four for instance Chinese or Arabic. And if you look uh, at how well the MLAT predicts for one versus high lab, you see that the correlations are higher for the MLAT than for high lab. But as expected, this was really the whole uh, goal. When you look at um, category four, then you see that uh, the high lab performs uh, somewhat better, uh, especially if you look at what is called ES, the eventual success, not necessarily success within the given time limits of the school, but eventual success. Age, of course, is also a predictor that plays a role, especially in the higher languages. Okay, so summarizing that in maybe a more readable form for category one languages, the MLT is the best predictor, high lab the weakest, language histories in between, and then as the languages get harder from one to three to four, high lab performs better and better, till for category four it is the best predictor. And again, for the eventual success, the story is slightly different, as you can see, uh, but high lab again becomes the best predictor for eventual success for category four. Okay, so the relative strength of the predictors clearly depends on uh, difficulty of language, uh, level to be predicted, and also to a minor extent on whether you look at speed versus eventual success, or reading versus speaking, and so on. Now, how many aptitudes are there, or how fine-grained should our tests be? Um, many studies show that different measures, even of a fairly narrow construct like complex working memory, uh, consisting of various parts, do not correlate very well. Uh, that they have a different predictive value, which you would expect if they don't correlate very well. Uh, so therefore, it's a good idea at this point to use quite narrow measures and to use measures of multiple constructs and multiple measures of each construct. Of course, that's easy to say because, I mean, remember our discussions yesterday, you only have, say, two hours to test people. Uh, you cannot uh, let your number of tests proliferate. <coughs> So the most important warning is don't think that because you gave a test of working memory that you have measured working memory. You may very well have measured one very specific aspect that may be important under one particular condition for a certain type of learner. And that's why there is so much inconsistency in the literature. Because you don't really test the global concept of um, working memory in many cases. Okay, on the other hand, we have also learned about the concept of aptitude complexes, which means looking not at individual aptitudes, but at how they collaborate, how you can see certain clusters of aptitude that are important for certain tasks in second language learning. Of course, the problem is that easily when you go that way, you have endless combinations and interactions. Uh, which Kronbach, already the founder of ATI research in 1975, called the Hall of Mirrors, that everything interacts endlessly with everything else. And that becomes an even harder to replicate and to generalize. Even though you're getting closer to the truth, the likelihood of finding exactly the same thing next time becomes smaller, paradoxically. So it also becomes even harder to apply, obviously. 
So maybe it's more promising to develop good tests for implicit language learning aptitude because until now that has been very much neglected. It's not that I'm a big proponent of implicit learning and teaching, but um, certainly as Rich also pointed out in his talk, there is implicit learning going on, even in his learners who I think had, had quite a bit of explicit training before they went to Japan, right? Um, so the interest in implicit learning has two decades or more, I should probably say three decades of, 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 of history by now, but interest in aptitude for it is quite recent. Most research has only been about the learning. So these are a few references of, of research over the last couple of decades about uh, aptitude for implicit learning, there aren't all that many. The problems in that area is that, first of all, the SRT test is very, very often used for that. It's a serial reaction time test, which is based on how you can internalize a pattern of, say, light moving in different parts of the screen. Um, these tests are non-verbal and maybe not the best predictors of the verbal learning we are interested in. Um, even artificial grammar learning tests are not really verbal, because typically that is with, with letters. That's not really a verbal task. Um, and then the Lama D, which is used mostly by our students these days, uh, may test implicit aptitude, but UH's research, uh, research from other students like uh, Elena Kaczynski or Rio Maye in our department um, have all failed to replicate their findings. So it's always interesting when people in the same department find different findings. Uh, I hate it when somebody does research in the lab year after year and they all Predicting yourself a little bit shows that you're being honest. <laughs> okay, so a concerted effort is needed in this area. Also needed are tests that are better suited for use with learners of less education and no previous language learning experience. We tend to forget that uh, because many of us teach academic type students. But as you know, there is about how many? About 65 million refugees in the world at this point, according to United Nations estimates. Um, many of them end up, of course, in countries where there's different languages spoken. Many of them do not have very much education, even though there are many exceptions too. Um, so that's a population that we uh, haven't looked at very much. It would be more fair to also do research with them. It may lead to better prediction, of course. And it may also be a more interesting population for many of us to work with uh, because aptitude is so often uh, used as a control variable. So we need to know what we are doing there. And from a psycholinguistic perspective, I would say it's likely that we'll find more implicit learning there. And so we should put less emphasis on analytical ability and more on implicit learning ability for that population. Now, let's talk a bit about the dependent variables, measuring the learning outcomes. Here, too, the, the more implicit end of the spectrum has been vastly underrepresented. Um, we don't have many tests that are truly implicit. Um, a couple of them came up in uh, uh, Yuichi's talk also. Uh, word monitoring, he, he mentioned self-paced reading and the visual world paradigm. Um, but um, there are serious limitations on their use. Um, remember the, the, the visual world paradigm in which in the, it's not easy to find structures that you can test with that, that paradigm. It's quite complex. Uh, and in terms of word monitoring and self-paced reading, there's lack of salience of certain stimuli can really also interfere with the testing. So there are limitations on their use. And even beyond that, you can always wonder to what extent do they measure the same thing like visual word paradigm doesn't always correlate very well with, say, word monitoring. OK, so you could, beyond that, ask, is there even one such thing as implicit learning? Or is implicit learning just a vague term that we use for a variety of kinds of learning that all have in common, that they have nothing to do with the kind of explicit declarative learning that humans are so good at compared to other species? Okay, so some food for thought there. All right. so. Um, Meanwhile, and I think you which also alluded to this, it may be more important from a practical point of view to test something that may be a little bit easier to measure rather than implicit knowledge, automatized explicit knowledge, which after all is all that is needed by the end user. 
no employer, no parent, no school principal is going to walk up to you and say, you speak the foreign language very well, but are you sure your knowledge is implicit? <laughs> I can't imagine that. Okay, so uh, implicitness is psychologically very interesting, but it's not really what is required for practical reasons. What matters, of course, is uh, testing the ability for use that is both fluent and accurate at the same time, and this is a high priority too, assessing how well uh, aptitude uh, leads to communication skills, and we are doing that more and more, even though how to do that is not obvious, because we uh, struggle still after all these years to measure proficiency in an ideal way. Proficiency has many aspects, and each proficiency test has its limitations too. Now, from a more theoretical perspective, we should also get serious about linking aptitudes to different stages of learning. Because Ian has insisted on that in a number of publications, because we can all see that there is a difference between initial gra initially grabbing a word from the input, hearing it, remembering it, later integrating knowledge into fluent speech, and so on. These are very, very different stages of learning, requiring probably different aptitudes. Some people have done something along these lines in a broader sense, like Serafini and Sons, have looked at the diminishing role of working memory with increasing proficiency. The dependent variables there were um, untimed grammaticality judgment and elicited imitation. Uh, but what is needed here is, of course, much more fine-grained research looking at specific aptitude tests to predict particular aspects at a particular point for a particular individual. So in case you are looking for a topic for a dissertation or a thesis, there's plenty to do over there. Okay. Designs then to link the independent and the dependent variables. Recent tendencies here have been to, first of all, do more micro-research. For instance, looking at the role of aptitude in processing some type of feedback about some type of structure which may avoid overgeneralization, but which, of course, doesn't lead to the generalization that we would like. Um, and that may, on the other hand, help us take a process perspective. You know, what is going on exactly in this specific learning task? We also see more API research, which not only shows which combination of aptitude and treatment is most helpful, but also suggests why and when an aptitude is helpful in other words, what is the process that links them? Some recent examples of API research in SLA, there are more and more, so I certainly can't do anything exhaustive here. A um, couple of really interesting ones, Yilmaz showing, showing that explicit feedback uh, is better than implicit feedback only for learners with high aptitude for explicit learning. Not very surprising. Yilmaz and Granena explicit aptitude was only predictive under explicit feedback conditions. Xiao Feng Li, working memory was predictive of learning from explicit feedback and analytic ability predictive for learning from implicit feedback. Brooks, Kempe, and Sienov looked at uh, higher IQ being more compatible with more exemplars of a theory, lower IQ with fewer exemplars in, in the training phase. Um, and then, um, <coughs> What we see here uh, is from uh, uh, Yuichi's work. I think I skipped the slide here. No, well, um, OSPAN versus Lama F predicting learning under masked versus distributed learning. Uh, you can easily see that for OSPAN, the prediction of m learning under masked conditions is much stronger than for the prediction under distributed conditions, and for Lama F. Uh, which is a test of grammatical sensitivity, like uh, MLT4, uh, you see that the prediction is much stronger for distributed learning conditions than masked learning conditions. Okay, so uh, also looking at um, masked versus distributed um, learning, in other words, in the session interval, is a study by uh, Lee and Kaiser coming out sometime soon, based on, of course, on, on Lee's dissertation, uh, about tone in Chinese um, with many predictors and outcome variables. Uh, but the focus uh, here is on where we found the ADI effects, with the predictor being the uh, SRP task uh, as a measure of, of uh, procedural learning. 
uh, and two outcome tasks, oral word naming reaction time and oral picture reaction time, oral picture naming reaction time. So what you see here is that um, when you look at um, the results for um, on the, on the x-axis, the SRT test, and on the y-axis, reaction time, um, that you see that for the interstimulus interval, so the degree of, of uh, distribution of practice, you see that the one-day uh, interval students do better and better as they have more and more of this SRT aptitude, whereas the ones with one week do worse when the interval increases. And then when you uh, look at the retention interval, you see the opposite pattern that uh, the more of that aptitude, SRT aptitude there is, the better the people do uh, in the four week condition and the worse they do in the one week condition. So between the training and the eventual uh, test. Kaczynski and Kaiser, uh, this was about explicit explanation. Uh, provided during or before uh, training or both. And what this shows was that timing affected interactions in the sense that both working memory and aptitude were strongly predictive when no explicit rules were presented during practice and less when they were presented during practice. So presenting them during practice had a facilitative effect that lowered the role of aptitude, which is a typical finding in API research. Brown, Nielsen, and the Kaiser, the treatment variable here was pre-task planning. Um, when there was planning could be guided or unguided, could also be one before the other. Uh, let me skip through some of the detail here. The individual difference variables were, uh, variable was working memory, and the findings were that guided planning was good for attempted accuracy, unguided planning for fluency, but then from more kind of my point of view more interesting, high working memory learners were more likely to comply with the complex storytelling conditions, uh, instructions, uh, so they focused more on grammar and therefore there was less fluency for them uh, when the planning was unguided. Okay, so just some recent examples of API. One of the reasons to show you that this research has been rather haphazard because each time you have a very specific type of of treatment pairs that are being looked at, and it's a bit hard to generalize from all this beyond some obvious things, like the more you put the burden of processing on the student, the more important the corresponding aptitude is, is going to be. So it's been narrowly focused, sometimes poorly motivated. People tend to grab the same predictors over and over again. Working memory is a, is a, a popular one. Analytic ability is a popular one and sorely lacking in replication, especially as the results are often contradictory. For instance, Lee versus Yilmaz, uh, one says analytic ability uh, is compatible with implicit rather than explicit feedback. Uh, the other one says this is the other way around. Or here even a replication attempted by the same author who in one study finds that working memory is predictive for recast but not metalinguistic corrective feedback and in the second study, not predictive in either. Okay? So it takes courageous people to publish the results of the second study, right? Uh, we would be much better off if people did that more instead of <laughs> putting things in the drawer if they don't correspond to what they found before. Don't correspond to what they found before. OK, there's also little research on API in the sense of the role of aptitude in different contexts. For instance, the classroom versus study abroad. But there is a recent study by Ferreta Studenberg and Morgan Short uh, that um, shows that uh, declarative memory does not predict any change during the semester at home. Working memory predicted only processing and only in study abroad, but procedural memory predicted change in performance during study abroad and change in processing in both contexts. So the interpretation, of course, is that there is a shift going on from declarative to procedural knowledge over time, uh, something that uh, the whole uh, Georgetown group that Morgan Short came from originally has, has shown in a number of other studies also. These were all students of uh, Michael Ullman's uh, a number of years ago. So replication is sorely needed in API research even more than in other areas of research. Again, 
cornucopia of topics for MA thesis in polyphonic papers and so on. <laughs> now, we not only have aptitude treatment interactions, we also have aptitude by structure interactions. For instance, one study showed that culture fair IQ predicted learning the gender of transparent nouns and that reading span was a better predictor for non-transparent nouns. Um, Nonverbal IQ predicted learning and generalization of case marking in another study. Artificial grammar aptitude only predicted learning, not generalization. Or procedural memory predicted learning of simple rules and declarative memory that of complex rules in a study by Antonio et al. So there are these interactions too. Um, another example, musical ability predicts fine-grained differences in the perception of Chinese tone, but not whether the tone is produced uh, in an acceptable way as a representative of the toning. So that's what, what uh, Lee found in her study, in, in her dissertation. There's also aptitude by age interactions, something I have been particularly interested in. Um, summarizing it in one sentence, aptitude seems more important for uh, explicit, aptitude for explicit learning seems more important for ultimate attainment for older learners uh, and not for children. Um, and maybe more importantly still, no older learners even approach near native proficiency level unless they have high explicit aptitude. Okay, on that point, Abramson and Hiltestam confirmed or replicated exactly what I found in the 2000 study in their case with Swedish as a second language, in my case with Hungarian. However, aptitude for implicit learning may predict learning for both children and adults. That's certainly what uh, Gisela Granena, another one of our uh, former students, has argued recently. Um, and interactions between structure and age have also been documented, uh, first by Johnson and Newport, sort of in an exploratory fashion. I found similar things in 2000, and then uh, we did a more systematic study, the one published in 2017, showing that uh, salience uh, is very important in interaction with age, that age is more important uh, depending on the salience of the structure, or lack of it. So, all these aptitude by structure, aptitude by age, age by structure interactions are equally theoretically interesting, I think, as aptitude by treatment interactions, even though the latter has been researched a bit more. Practically speaking, adaptation along these lines, teaching in a different way, drawing on a different aptitude for a different structure, that's not going to offend anybody. Okay, so you don't have the problems, the social issues, the apartheid question and, and all of that. You only have maybe some practical issues, but even those are not as big. If you're going to teach different structures to the same people in different ways, you don't have to put them in different classrooms or anything like that. Obviously, if you want to teach everybody in a different way all the time, you will have to have many, many groups, and that's a big problem. So once more, research on these topics too is a priority, and replication should precede application, because I've already heard angry voices coming out of some uh, government agencies in Washington that the results of ATI research are being imposed on them to take decisions before one really is ready to do that on the basis of the little bit of research there is. Okay? So I can only agree with that, of course. All right, longitudinal perspectives for all kinds of reasons are rare in our field. Even though language learning, as we all know, is a long-term and changing endeavor, so again, um, let me refer once more to Peter Spien's work about aptitudes being differentially important at different stages. We have some evidence along these lines, uh, like Morgan Short et al. showing the diminishing role of declarative memory and the increasing role for procedural memory. The Serafini and Sounds study that I already quoted, diminishing role of working memory, and similar findings, of course, in other kinds of skill acquisition outside of SLA. So, the change that takes place for a given structure over a fairly short period of time probably takes place for the language more broadly over a longer period of time. And that, of course, is a big research question of how do you pull these two apart? Do you look at the micro thing or do you look at the, the macro thing? Not easy to disentangle. OK. Now, again, research on ATI is not just on A and T. It is actually. Uh, important for understanding the processes, and that is really what leads me in a second to my next topic, because that's where I think um, uh, neurosciences could be the most useful. For instance, for understanding the critical period, 
it is important to know why children do better than adults, to put it very simply. Um, I've tried to get at that indirectly by looking at the role of different aptitudes uh, at different ages, suggesting different processes of learning. The role of aptitude, the role of, of age, I mean, in the learning of different kinds of structures, again, suggesting more explicit learning uh, at a later age. But all of that obviously is correlational and, and indirect. Um, this is also important for the interface hypothesis. Uh, what uh, Yuichi presented earlier today was an example of that. Uh, showing that um, over a long period of time, explicit learning can lead to implicit uh, knowledge, um, but it takes a very long time, and the pathway tends to be from explicit aptitude to explicit knowledge to implicit knowledge, rather than directly from implicit to implicit. It's also, of course, important for understanding the relative effectiveness of different teaching methods. That's the most obvious one. Theoretical integration. By studying these interactions systematically, we can perhaps shed more light than any other approach, except maybe eventually neuroscience, uh, on what kinds of aspects of second language acquisition uh, different aspects have in common and what sets them apart. So, conclusion so far, I'm not at the end yet, just conclusion so far, we have four priorities. Um, test development for specialized aptitudes and special populations, research on the interaction of aptitudes with age linguistic structure in a context, much more application, and better understanding of the processes. And so here is where I'm going to switch to the question, how can neuroscience help? Uh, first of all, obviously, it is a replication at a higher level, in the sense of not just replicating behaviorally, but in a very different way, sometimes replicating behavior, behavioral results, showing that the differences in what you see in the brain confirm what you think is the case from behavioral tests. Um, that can happen with differences in brain anatomy, as we saw yesterday in uh, Christoph's talk. With lots, there is even uh, differences in, in the brain that has been documented in some older studies. Um, we can look at slow development or show the development over time uh, from, for instance, the shift from declarative to procedural knowledge or other aspects of the effect of practice to illustrate the processes. Uh, a very early example of that, not exactly SLA, but in the language domain, was Posner and Reichel. And then for the clarity and procedural, Morgan Short it out. So let me show a picture that you've probably seen. Uh, this is uh, getting old now, but it's such a nice picture that I think it's worth showing. Uh, so you see um, three different views on the brain from top to bottom, obviously. Uh. <laughs> Um, and what you see from left to right is different levels of practice. So on the left-hand side, you have completely uh, unpracticed learners that are, for, that are confronted with a new task. And as you can see, there is high activation uh, in the frontal lobe and, and in the, the cerebellum. Um, then uh, when there is much more practice, basically all that disappears and you see uh, some uh, more intense activation uh, in the what seems to me the occipital lobe, correct me if I'm wrong, and to some extent the cerebellum, but as soon as you change the task a bit so it becomes novel, you see more activation again, so more that suggests at least I think more uh, activation of broader overall processes, control processes rather than the isolated uh, specialized processes. Uh, Morgan Short et al, yeah, don't, there's no need to look at every single picture here separately, uh, they looked at declarative and procedural knowledge being engaged early and late in the stage. I've only took, taken a couple of the uh, pictures here. This one is for um, the uh, declarative memory at the beginning of learning, and then they have other pictures for procedural memory at, at the end of learning, so showing very different involvement of the different kinds of memory at different stages in learning. Of course, neuroscience can help document aspects of second language processing is more than RT, because so far, when you look at the behavioral research, very often when we talk about language processing, it's all about reaction times. Okay, some of my colleagues refer to that whole brand of research as button-pushing people, okay, because it's all about fast button pressing. Um, hopefully, neuroscience can also show the effect of different kinds and different amounts of practice on subsequent knowledge and processing. 
that was already referred to uh, earlier today. Uh, and that, of course, is a very important practical goal. I haven't said too many practical things yet today, so that's an important practical goal. And it could also show differences in representation and processing as a result of age of acquisition, rather than through the correlational uh, techniques I've used. Um, but, of course there's a but, um, fine-grained hypotheses uh, are needed that are based on solid behavioral research because if you're looking at the brain not knowing at all what you're looking for, it's unlikely you'll find much. Okay? So some of the earlier uh, neuroscience research on SLA was really not informed even by existing behavioral research. And then sometimes people will say, well, we looked at the brains of young learners and we looked at the brains of older learners and we don't see a difference. Well, if you look at it that way, you're not likely to, to see uh, a difference in your functional imaging. Okay? Uh, so we need fine-grained hypotheses, we need reliable measurements, we need sizable samples. This is something I've never understood very well. Maybe the neuroscientists here can tell me why that is, why so many neuroscience research studies have such a small sample size to the extent that we wouldn't get away with it to publish that in, in the behavioral research. Maybe it comes from the medical tradition where often they have very few participants for obvious ethical reasons. You know, you, you cannot have too few, but you're not allowed by IRBs and so on to have more participants than needed either because the treatment can be a risk. So I don't know whether that's the reason, but that always surprises me because I don't see a good reason for it in this case. Very expensive. Expensive also, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it's not necessarily the case uh, that uh, an fMRI study is more expensive, for instance, than a behavioral one, and depending on what you do. But, but I know that I know. It, it tends to be ex expensive. Um, also, um, what we should do, and maybe some of you will laugh and say, isn't that obvious? Strive for both temporal and spatial resolution. You probably know that fMRI has very, very good uh, spatial resolution, uh, whereas ERP, for instance, has better temporal resolution but worse spatial resolution. Actually, the, the whole inventor of, of uh, the ERP uh, told us in a, in a seminar a number of years ago that one should not use ERP to locate processes. It's only sophisticated reaction time measuring set. And that's the, the inventor of the methodology. So if he says that, we probably have to take that seriously. Yet, how many nice colorful pictures have you seen with brains that uh, are shaded in different colors uh, on the basis of different parts of the brains shaded in different colors depending on ERP or on ERP research. Okay. Longitudinal studies, I know, I know, you don't want to hear this because they cost even more and you may lose subjects in the process. Now, as an example to stimulate discussion, because after all that's why we're here and uh, we've, we've had really some pretty good discussions already over the last couple of days. Um, Here's what my dream study would look like, and uh, it's very un unspecified at this point. I'm asking questions rather than answering them, of course, okay? Uh, a longitudinal study on the development of declarative versus procedural knowledge, or maybe you may want to say explicit versus implicit, we could talk about that all day, in children and young adults. Because the claim is, not only my claim, but the claim of a whole bunch of people in the field, is that the learning processes are very different. That's why we have the so-called critical period phenomenon. Now, what exactly is going on? I mean, it's not just a quantitative difference in how much they learn. Um, so I already mentioned my hypothesis, uh, shared by at least some people, uh, that there is a shift from implicit to explicit learning. Uh, but there's also uh, indirect evidence uh, from uh, aptitude correlations from structure and so on, as I mentioned before. And uh, Uichi also uh, referred, of course, to this implicit explicit distinction and how you can look at it uh, with uh, fMRI. Uh, there's also a very interesting study by Pili Moss et al. that came out uh, very recently in bilingualism. So I'd like to briefly uh, summarize that as background to what I want to talk about. Uh, she, or they, I should say, looked at declarative and procedural memory as predictors of both accuracy and automatization during second language practice. And automatization here was operationalized as the coefficient of uh, variation. So the, the, the standard deviation divided by the mean, which people like Segalovitz have always insisted on should be the norm if you want to talk about uh, real automatization. So English was the first language. The second language was an artificial language, Procounto two, again coming out of the Georgetown group from years ago. Uh, what they found is that declarative memory, as measured by part five of the MLAT, which is paired associates, and the continuous visual memory task, 
uh, they found that accuracy was predicted during comprehension practice by declarative memory, whereas procedural memory was a better uh, uh, predictor of automatization, and procedural memory was measured with the weather prediction task and the Tower of London task that we may have heard of. I can show you some pictures of the CVMT at the end of this time, uh, but I, uh, oops, I don't think we will be time. Um, all right, so then, um, here is uh, more detail of what she found. So for comprehension practice, um, she found the overall declarative uh, memory predicting. But then when she looked at CV, automatization in other words, she found that procedural predicted throughout and declarative did not. Now, interestingly, the relationship, you cannot see that in this table, but she looked at this in more detail. And the relationship between high declarative memory, uh, sorry, the relationship between procedural memory ability and the outcome that became stronger over time for people with high declarative abilities and weaker over time for people with low declarative abilities, probably suggesting that people with low declarative abilities didn't have enough solid knowledge to, to proceduralize, whereas the others were more and more proceduralizing that knowledge and using more and more their procedural skits. So yes, this is a, a graph illustrating that. So you have um, the high, middle, and low declarative learners uh, at the three levels. And then if you go from left to right, the early stage, middle stage, and later stage. So you can see that for high uh, declarative, uh, it goes down. Uh, at least it's steep. And down is good, by the way, here. OK, so it's, it's a steep graph that becomes steeper over time. And when you look at the bottom, low declarative, it becomes flatter over time. So the correlation becomes bigger in one case, smaller in the other case. All right, so the next steps along these lines, I'm going to hurry up. Um, um, next steps along these lines, first of all, of course, replicating something like what she found, trying to generalize it to other structures and to more sessions. She only had four practice sessions, which is not very much for a study like this. Test this with children, too. This was all with adults. And there you will probably would have to make the difference between immersion learning and foreign language in the elementary school. Okay? Don't ever let any of your colleagues call foreign language in the elementary school immersion learning as they do in many places in the US. Okay? Immersion is almost the opposite of what is being done in those schools. It's a totally different learning process of being immersed over a long period of time, probably learning implicitly versus the three or four hours a week maximum that they get in very traditional teaching there. You're being young doesn't help with that. All right, so I would like to see, in other words, a really longitudinal study for both children and adults. So not just looking at these two or three populations, but a longitudinal study for each. Okay. Um, and I would like to see the nature of the knowledge assessed, uh, not only behaviorally, but also um, through fMRI or whatever other technique. Now we've known for a long time that you, of course, can distinguish declarative and procedural uh, activation uh, by doing fMRI from the early 90s. The work of Squire and many associates has shown that. So this is not exactly a newfangled thing that may disappear next week. Um, <coughs> so can we find neurological correlates for declarative procedural memory ability? That's a different question. I'm not sure anybody has looked at that. So they've looked at the declarative and procedural knowledge being used, but the ability to learn in two different ways, I'm not sure if we have any work on that yet from the point of view of the neurosciences. Um, so we may want to look at the effect of learning online through ERP or fMRI, but of course there's also the viewpoint that we saw represented by Dr. Piaskas yesterday, uh, anatomically, over long periods of time, you can even see the effects of different kinds of learning, to summarize the many things he said in just one simple sentence. Okay, um, so all of this would, for many people, be more convincing than behavioral work, um, whether it necessarily should be, I don't know, but certainly it would be a good addition to our arsenal if you want to convince somebody to show uh, brain pictures rather than boring tables with numbers. Okay, that, that is something you cannot avoid. Okay, so again, uh, some more issues in this particular case now. The behavioral instrumentation for declarative procedure is problematic. The two tests that I mentioned there for declarative don't correlate very well. The two I mentioned for procedural don't correlate very well. 
uh, another one of Morgan Short students just published a study on that, uh, <laughs> showing the doubtful validity of, of, of some of these tests. Um, Buffington, yeah, I was forgetting the name. Um, so, Man Lee, one of my own students, found that the continuous visual memory test correlated better with working memory than with other aspects of declarative memory. So, all of that is not very nice. Um, assuring long term participation is, of course, always a problem. Uh, so, often studies that you would like to be longitudinal become cross sectional. Uh, then, of course, very important for you to all think about what tasks to use to measure the brain activity. Uh, we want to give implicit activity, so to speak, a chance. Uh, on the other hand, we want to structure our tasks so that we know what kinds of grammar structures are being used and what, what the issue is. And these two are hard to reconcile. So typically, the way people do that is by looking only at comprehension and looking something like using something like ERP, because there you can build the errors you want into uh, a stimulus. And people may be reading for comprehension; they are not focused on form. There, that is uh, possible, um, but um, that's only for comprehension. And we are also interested in production, as you know, and then of course. All right. So measurement itself. Uh, this is an obvious question. The, again, the issue of spatial and temporal resolution. My understanding from the rumor mill is that uh, fMRI is getting better in terms of, of temporal resolution. Uh, so if that is really going to be the case, well, maybe we don't need to worry so much about this. But at this point, there is really a big choice to be made there because you can, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you can at this point not take an fMRI picture of what happens when somebody processes a particular error. Right? You have to have the same process uh, happening a number of times. And uh, some studies I've seen of that are tend to be absurd. They will have a certain error with, with uh, good grammar forms a whole bunch of times. But then what you're doing is basically showing us neuroscientifically what a, what a, a mechanical drill looks like. Okay? So that's not even what, we, what we're interested in. So we need to think very carefully about what tasks to use. Okay, now, sorry that I'm going over time a little bit. Let me just end with uh, a little pep talk here. Why take aptitude and age seriously? I don't know whether you know any of these three people here. Well, in two and three, you wouldn't know. Number one, you may know, uh, this is Ken Hale, who was professor of uh, linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, a well-known centratician, but legendary as a field linguist. Okay? He would go to remote parts of Australia, document an Aboriginal language, and not only be good at figuring out the structure, but then teach himself the language and teach his children, and on the basis of a field work, after three weeks, people say, speak that language fluently. Okay. All right, then the second one is one of my former students, did an MA with us. He um, grew up in a neighborhood where there were Spanish and Chinese speakers, and apparently his parents were very, very busy professionally, and he spent a lot of time with the neighbors. He learned Spanish when he was young, then later would major in Spanish in college, but then I think the Spanish speakers moved, and then he <laughs> ended up with Chinese speakers. So he is perfect, sounds perfectly native in English, Spanish, and Chinese which he wouldn't have accomplished if he had started later. Number three is um, somebody who was a, a guide for me when I was bird watching in Indonesia. He is a more typical learner. Uh, he learned English in school and then practiced a lot. I really went out of his way to practice with his teacher, with a couple of his cousins who were more advanced and so on. And I can testify he speaks very fluently and accurately. Of course, he has an accent. And of course, he makes the occasional mistake. But he's very easy to communicate with. So I would call these three people three good language learners, but in very, very different ways. This one was a good language learner largely because of age, although I think he would also have done rather well without that. Uh, this one, well, because he got good systematic teaching, systematic practice, and was very motivated. And this one, of course, because he had absolutely exceptional analytical abilities. You know, you don't get to teach linguistics at MIT if you don't have good <laughs> ability to analyze structure. Okay, so it's not just a matter of, oh, these people here are not very good learners. We, we have to find an excuse for them. We should teach them differently the way it sometimes gets presented politically. No, these three people were all very good learners who all achieved a lot, but in very different ways. Okay, so that's our duty, among many others, to keep this in mind. How do we get different kinds of people to learn better, and especially when it comes to immigrants, uh, to, to people with 
uh, low levels of learning aptitude, to people with very specific needs, we have to cater to them. So when I retire, which is uh, not very far into the future, uh, one of my ideas is to develop a TBMT course for bird watching guides um, because they need very specific knowledge. They need to be able, for instance, to describe where a certain bird is very specifically. It's nothing more frustrating than a guide who says, that really rare bird you really want to see is there. Okay? <laughs> that drives you nuts. So they have to be able to describe exactly, you know, you go up a couple of feet on that trunk and then go to the right to the second branch and then you see those uh, pale leaves there and then go up a little bit to the right from that. That's where the bird is. Okay? So you need to know English other well to be able to do this or at least this kind of thing. So um, anyway, I, I'll stop here because I'm going over time. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, so patient. And if you have any questions, I'm ready.